Uh, I want to start the, the morning off by welcoming our Facebook audience. Uh, this gives us a chance to bring our global audience uh, to WEP, to let them experience uh, some of the things that are obviously the, the KAUS community gets to see on a daily basis throughout these two weeks. Um, please, if you are part of our online audience, submit questions. Uh, today, Dr. Stone will be answering questions from me and, and some from our audience here, but then also uh, definitely from the online audience as well. So my name is Nicholas DeMille. I'm the head of University Editorial Services here. Um, and I am so honored to open this session with Dr. Edward C. Stone. He's an internationally known physicist with a, an extensive resume that uh, certainly I don't need to quote here. I'd rather ask him a few things about his experience. Um, and I, Dr. Stone, I'd, I'd like to start off uh, asking you about your, the beginning of your career. Uh, you earned your master's and a PhD at the University of Chicago. Kind of walk us through from there uh, where your career progressed to. I was very lucky. I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago in 1956, starting in 1956. And of course, in 1957, the space age began with the launch of Sputnik. Right. And so I was there at the beginning, fortunately, was able to do a, an instrument, build an instrument to launch into space in the 1961. Uh, and then uh, from that, I moved to Caltech, which, where I've been now for over 50 years. And uh, that, uh, to set up a space physics uh, uh, research group at, the, uh, at Caltech. Uh, that was 1964. By 1972, I had been asked to spend part of, part of my time up at JPL as a chief scientist for what became the Voyager mission. Uh, so that was possible because Caltech runs JPL for NASA. It's a NASA laboratory, but it's run by Caltech. So I started that in 1972, and I'm still at it. Uh, the Voyager mission is the mission that went to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune uh, during, from 1997 through 1989. And that, after that, we continued on what's called the Voyager Interstellar Mission, hoping to eventually get outside the bubble the sun creates around itself with its wind. And uh, that happened in 2012, finally, after a very, another very long journey. Uh, in 2012, Voyager 1 left the bubble and is now in the space that's between the stars, interstellar space, where we're surrounded by matter that came from other stars than our sun. So that's the kind of a quick summary of the planetary part of my career. Um, I, I, I've heard or I've seen in previous interviews with you that uh, it was a graduate student who at Caltech who had worked out that the planets were going to be aligned in such a way. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yes. Uh, it was, uh, uh, that was 1965 mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was working at JPL for the summer and one of his tasks uh, was to uh, look for opportunities to fly by a planet because, say, Jupiter is in orbit around the sun, and if you approach Jupiter the right way, Jupiter will grab the space gra gravitationally and fling it out like a slingshot and speed it up. Uh, and so, uh, and it turned out that what he discovered was that in 1977, a spacecraft can fly by Jupiter, onto Saturn, onto Uranus, and then finally onto Neptune, all in the order uh, once every 176 years are they all together on the same side of the sun. So that became the urgency for creating a new kind of spacecraft that could actually go venture this far deep into space. In 1977, most spacecraft only lasted a year or two. And so this was already a stretch even to think to go to Saturn, much less to Uranus and Neptune. So that was done in a stepwise fashion uh, as we pressed the limits of technology of that era. Mm -hmm. And, and so we're continuing, NASA is continuing to communicate with both of the Voyager uh, devices, essentially. How, how, is, how are they still running? What did you guys do differently uh, to extend that life exponentially? One key thing <clears throat> is the power. Of course, the sun out there, you couldn't use solar panels. The sun's much too dim once you get that far away from the sun. Uh, so we have uh, natural radioactive decay of plutonium-238, which creates heat. And there are lots of thermal couples bolted to the heat source, which generate electricity. Now, of course, it's radioactive decay, which means there's less of it each year than there was the year before. So we have to find ways to turn things off four watts at a time. Every year we have four watts less than we had the year before. Mm -hmm. And so we can predict we'll have enough electrical power to run roughly another 10 years mm -hmm. uh, with the instruments we have. And this, but then we'll have to start turning off instruments one by one and 
maybe in 15 years from now, that will be it. We will not hear from Voyager any longer. Right. We listen every day. They transmit 24-7, can't save the power. Mm -hmm. It's radioactive decay. It's going to happen whether you use the power or not. So we transmit 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We don't listen that much because we have other spacecraft that require attention as well from these antennas. Mm -hmm. uh, so we listen typically a minimum of four hours every day and mm, typically maybe even up to eight or ten depending on how busy the deep space network tracking antennas are. Okay. And, and what's interesting to think about is uh, this is 1976 technology, I suppose. Uh, we're so used to being able to update things on a weekly basis. So, I, so, I mean, how do you overcome some of the challenges, I mean, uh, of, of keeping that thing updated and running? And, and the Voyagers were the first fully automated spacecraft, mm -hmm. totally computer controlled. The mm -hmm. computers have typically 4,000 words of memory, all right? <laughs> <laughs> your 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 uh, smartphone has 240,000 times more memory than the, all the computers on Voyager have. Uh, so you do need to send up instructions to the computer. You can change the program, and we do once in a while send up a set of commands to change a little bit of the program on the spacecraft. So we can reprogram, just like you can down, download a new app to your smartphone. We can we can change the program on the spacecraft by sending up commands to do that, and we do that right. periodically uh, to ke keep the things up to date. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I, I want to get back to you, because uh, I know that you're going to talk about Voyager this evening, so I don't want to yeah. um, spoil that fun too much. Um, but looking back uh, down the trajectory of your career, I mean, was this what you expected? Uh, you you were, grew up in Knoxville, Iowa, I believe? I was born in Knoxville, Iowa. Okay. I grew up in Burlington, Iowa, in the Mississippi River. Okay. Uh, and I was interested in science as a youngster. I just liked to know how things work. I built radios, uh, oscilloscopes, all that sort of electronic gear was the high technology <clears throat> at the time, and that's what I did. Uh, and uh, when I went off to the University of Chicago, I was intending to major in nuclear physics, which was one of the frontier areas of physics at the time. Uh, and then the space age happened. And uh, that's a whole other set of opportunities to do science, to learn about what's out there and how it works and why it's the way it is, how it's changing with time, how it became what it is. Those are, that's part of what science is all about. And so that's what I've been doing ever since 1961. Mm -hmm. Was there an environment in Burlington, Iowa, that uh, that led to your gravitating towards science? Did you have, uh, were your parents scientists? Uh, my father was a construction superintendent, so he built buildings. Right. So he, you know, he certainly knew technical things, but he wasn't a scientist. Uh, but I was encouraged. I mean, people would give me a crystal set for my first radio or slide rule. Well, I, there, there, people were just handing me things that, to keep me busy. <laughs> And I had great fun learning things. Did you have a big family growing up? Or you and only I had one brother. One brother, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Um, so, in a previous interview, you were quoted as saying that Voyager was essentially going to last forever. It's a, in some ways, an envoy. Uh, and when we send these spacecraft out, they're going to be orbiting uh, around the Milky Way for a long time. <laughs> longer than we can almost imagine. So did you guys think of that purposefully? Did you uh, do something with the spacecraft? Did you put some sort of message on there? This is always... Well, we did put the famous golden record exactly. on the spacecraft exactly. because we knew that these spacecraft were going to be, every 225 million years, will make one orbit around the Milky Way, center of a Milky Way galaxy. Mm -hmm. And this will go on for billions of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and w they will be our silent ambassadors with their message uh, on this grooved record, a 16 and two-thirds RPM double-sided record right. uh, with images of Earth, greetings from Earth in many languages, of sounds of Earth, uh, music from around the world uh, as a way of saying this is the place that sent the, set this spacecraft. Right. It, and isn't it so interesting uh, how far we've come in our technology from an LP uh, or a record album to today in the way that we consume music? Um, talk a little bit more about the, the technology. Um, how involved were you in developing the technology for the actual uh, spacecraft and, and launching and everything? I, was the, I started in 1972 as the chief scientist, which meant my job was to help the 11 scientific teams to represent 
them and their in, uh, scientific interests to the engineers on the project mm -hmm. and also to represent back to the science teams what the engineering challenges were to do what we wanted to do. So I was kind of a matching, impedance matching between uh, the engineers that have to design the new spacecraft and the scientists who are, we need to use it to, to do science. Mm -hmm. uh, and that I started in 1972 and the launches were in 1977. So yes, I was involved in, in many meetings having to do with the trade also, well, can we do this or what, why can't we do that? How much can we try this? Because it's always a balancing act. You want to do as much as you can, but you don't want to do more than you can mm -hmm. because then you, then you don't get anything. Right. <clears throat> Um, in this age of tech and innovation, we're always talking about change. We're always talking about the new thing. I, I was actually wondering, uh, since you have a longer view uh, of a scientific career and the development of technologies, uh, what things have stayed the same about science? What, what things are uh, fundamental and, and that shouldn't be innovated in a way? I mean, not that anything shouldn't be questioned, but, but you know, what things are, are really foundational for scientists? Well, foundational for science is understanding what's out there, and that is quantifying it so that, in fact, you can apply uh, equations and algorithms which allow you then to extrapolate from what you know to something you don't know. Mm -hmm. you can, in other words, science is a way to organize what you know about how the world, how the universe works uh, without having to look at every single item in the universe to think that you understand. Mm -hmm. uh, so that part of science is still the same. What changes is are the, uh, the ability to look at, uh, to measure, to observe. <laughs> more and more sensitive observ observing tools, more and more capable computers to analyze the data. The data now is, much, uh, this is the era of big data where the data comes in such big buckets uh, that you need special programs to even look at the data mm -hmm. and to sort through it to look for the patterns because it's the patterns in the data which, which is the thing which helps you organize what you know without having to know every single piece of data. Uh, that's kind of what science is about. It's still that way, but the, the, the quantity is clearly much greater today in the terms of the data one has, one can get, and the data one can analyze uh, to understand more complicated, complex interactions. Um, so you were involved in several of the Mars uh, missions as well. Uh, so how did the level of technology change from 76 when both of the Voyager craft went off to some of the, the, the Mars uh, missions? The key thing in the Mars that's happened that's different is uh, we actually have rovers on the surface. But the Viking land, two Viking spacecraft landed on Mars back in 1976. So landing on Mars, was for, that was the first time. Mm -hmm. But those landed and that's where they were. They're stuck where they <laughs> came down. Even though there might have been an interesting rock over there, they could not go there. They right. could maybe shine a light on it, do some spectroscopy, but they couldn't go there and, and bore, grill, drill a hole in it or anything like that or yeah. explore for a different layer. Yeah. That's what the rovers in 1997 was the first rover, the little Sojourner rover, yeah. which showed the power of being able to move around. Because when you land, you, you really are taking chances to where it is you land. You have a general idea, but you don't know specifically. And you may not land in a very interesting spot where, if you can't move. Mm -hmm. Rovers allow you to move and start exploring just as you would if you were a geologist out, uh, out there. Right. So, so you said that um, the Voyager craft had a memory of about 400 words, I think. So, so give us a sense for that in comparison to uh, the Sojourner. Oh, uh, well, the little Sojourner still had very limited memory. Okay. Uh, it did have microprocessors, right. so that because it was, you know, 20, basically 20 years later. Uh, so it was, uh, so it had some rather modern computers, uh, but it had limited power because it was a small unit, it had a small set of solar panels, so everything had to be run very, very slowly. You, right. you didn't, you couldn't, you couldn't run it fast. Right. Um, and how many missions were you involved, uh, uh, Mars-based missions were you involved in? Well, I was the director of JPL between 1991 and 2001, and we had, during that time, maybe three or four Mars missions. I, I, I don't remember the exact number, but mm -hmm. we had also Earth-based missions. We had missions, uh, we were to launch the mission Cassini to Saturn when I was the director. Uh, we were building the, what became the Spitzer infrared telescope mm -hmm. uh, when I was director. There, there were many uh, projects underway during that 10-year period. Okay. 
How do you listen to these craft? You talked about listening uh, about four hours a day to the Voyager, yeah. but in general, how do you listen to these guys? The spacecraft have, a, have radios on them which transmit mm -hmm. uh, through an antenna which focuses the radio beam on the Earth. And on the Earth, there are some large antennas, big dish antennas to collect the radio uh, signal from the, each spacecraft. It's a radio signal, basically, and it's ones and zeros. The first digital images, we all have digital television in our living room these days, but the first digital images came back from Mars in 1964 because you couldn't send back the analog at all. You had to send back ones and zero, one zero is at six, I think it was about 16 bits per second. Right. Incredibly slow rate because the signals were so weak back in those early days. Mm -hmm. um, when a Mars rover sends back information, what's the, what's the time delay for that? Uh, it's 20, 30 minutes, depends on where Mars is with respect to the Earth and its orbit, and that varies it during the year. Right, but in space time, that's, it, that's awfully fast. Yeah, it's, it's compared to Voyager, that's almost now. Right. <laughs> how, <coughs> excuse me, how long does it take for Voyager to send back information? It's about, it's about <coughs> 19 hours now Okay. for Voyager 1. So you send, and you hope, yeah. and you yeah. wait. Yeah, <coughs> and you wait. Tell us uh, something that we probably don't know about Mars. Well, they, this, the Curiosity rover is landed in Gale Crater, and there's a large mountain in the middle of the crater, uh, which has layers in it, just like the Grand Canyon. It is now, that rover is now moving up layer by layer. So as you move up, further up the sl side of the mountain, you're getting earlier and earlier, more and more recent in time, because there, there's sedimentary layers <coughs> laid down, the oldest layer is at the bottom, the, young, the youngest layer is on top. What they've discovered now is that the chemistry of the rock material in the young, younger layers up the top indicate that there was modification that went on with the presence of water. And that's that minerals changed in the process. And this is the kind of thing that happens on Earth where there are regions that life evolved. Now we have no evidence that that particular location has life today or it ever had life, mm -hmm. but it seems to have the chemistry uh, of the rocks, which is similar to here on Earth where life did, uh, does flourish. Okay. Um, what is your view then on extraterrestrial life, other species? Uh, have you, I know that recently that there were some radio signals from a, a nearby system uh, that were, were heard again. Um, so I'm just wondering what, what what you think the chances are that in the next 50, 100 years we'll actually uh, contact some other civilization or that sort of thing? I, I think many scientists believe that life has evolved elsewhere. Mm -hmm. We think life evolved elsewhere in the solar system. Here on Earth, wherever you find liquid water, mm -hmm. whether it's up where it's cold and near it's icy or it's down in a rock mm -hmm. uh, or it's in the coming of ocean vents, of the ocean floor where it's almost boiling water, you find microbial life. It's everywhere there's liquid water. So the <clears throat> challenge we have in the solar system is to find the places where there was liquid water, like Mars, or maybe someplace there still is liquid water. Mm -hmm. The case of Saturn, there's the moon Enceladus, which has geysers erupting from its south pole, which have water, so we know there's an ocean there. Mm -hmm. At Jupiter, there's the moon Europa, which we now know, thanks to Galileo mission, that it has an ice, uh, liquid water ocean beneath it, its icy crust. Those are the places we want to explore to see if there's any evidence that microbial life uh, existed or exists. It would even be best, of course, or if still the life that we could uh, look at. All right. Um, and tell us about how many rovers are there on Mars? Like how many of these little guys are driving around and, and checking out the, the environment there? Well, the uh, Sojourner is still there, but it doesn't work anymore. Okay. Uh, Spirit and Opportunity, I think it's Opportunity is still working, mm -hmm. although slowly. Mm -hmm. And Spirit, I think, has stopped. Uh, Curiosity is the most recent one. It's the one which is exploring the, the layers in Mount, in Mount Sharp uh, in, the, in the Gale Crater. Uh, those, that's all the rovers that are on Mars. So, so we don't have a lot. Now, there are in preparation are a couple more rovers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so in the next uh, four or five years, we'll see additional rovers uh, also exploring. You have to remember, uh, Mars has more surface area than the Earth in the sense of solid surface. And you can, you can well imagine the challenge. You could say, if you landed on Earth in two or three places, 
and analyzed it. Do you think you'd understand Earth as a planet? Right. Probably not. Yeah. You probably need to look at more than a few places. So we're just started. Mm -hmm. That's the physical frontier. There are five frontiers of space. Physical frontier is just going someplace nothing's been before. Science frontier is learning what's out there and why it's the way it is. Then there's a technology frontier, building the, the vehicles that carry the instruments and the instruments themselves to study uh, what's out there. The applications frontier, using space to better life here on Earth. And the uh, human frontier, which is the, how, how human physiology, psychology, and so on uh, is affected by the environment and space. Right. So Voyager passed through one of those frontiers that you're going to talk about tonight. Give us a little uh, primer on what is inter interstellar space and, and why is it so interesting that we've actually got two craft there now? Yeah. You know, the sun has a wind blowing radially outward from it. It's the sun's atmosphere basically expanding supersonically, mm -hmm. one and a half million kilometers per hour or more. And this, that wind, which is the sun's atmosphere, creates a bubble mm -hmm. around itself. And the bubble stops when its pressure matches the pressure of the wind outside, which has come from the explosion of other stars. Mm -hmm. So inside the bubble, we're surrounded by material from the sun mm -hmm. and the magnetic field from the sun. Outside the bubble, we're affected by stuff that came from the explosion of other stars five or 10 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And the magnetic field is the magnetic field of the Milky Way galaxy. So we're in a region which is distinctly different from being inside. And we crossed that boundary with Voyager 1 in August of 2012 and have been studying it now for the last four years, mm -hmm. trying to better understand how these two winds interact. Mm -hmm. um, do you imagine that there's tremendous uh, Turbulence when, when the craft pass through this margin, basically, and out of the bubble into that interstellar space and are exposed to these other um, radiation forces? It turns out space is almost empty. This is a better vacuum out there than anything here on Earth. So the spacecraft itself is unaware that all this has happened. All our instruments can measure this very dilute uh, plasma ionized wind which is out there. Okay. So uh, I think that's. It, it's, not a, it's not a challenge for the spacecraft. Okay, okay. Excellent. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the rest of that for this evening for you to talk about. And that's, uh, that's pretty much most of the questions that I had. Uh, I wanted to see if anybody in our audience today had, had any questions for Dr. Stone. <clears throat> okay, well, I'll ask a question. <laughs> In that case, um, Dr. Stone, I'm wondering if you can comment on how or what you think the appropriate balance in terms of resource expenditures, time, and um, between manned spaceflight and unmanned robotic spaceflight. Well, human spaceflight really has a different motivation than than the scientific robotic spacecraft. The robotic space will always be able to send robots more places than humans will ever go, if, for several reasons. One reason being it's just a lot easier to send a robot than a robot than it is a person. But there's something about humans in space which is clearly widely uh, interesting to people, and the challenge there is first of all understanding how, human, how, how humans react to extended durations of years uh, and the engineering challenges of leaving Earth orbit where nothing can come to help you. Uh, if as long as you're in Earth orbit, and that includes on, near the moon, it's easy to get home. It's only a few days, no matter what. It's easy to send something up, only a few days. If you're on your way to Mars, uh, you, there is no way that, to send something to catch up with that spacecraft. You just have to wait two years until the Earth's back in position. That may be way too late for what's going on. So it's a much more challenging engineering activity uh, than we've experienced so far. And that's the building blocks one has to work on in the years ahead so that one will know whether someday humans can actually go to Mars and get back safely. Um, to what degree is JPL involved in uh, human spacecraft? Uh, the human spacecraft activity is, main, is centered mainly at uh, the uh, JSC, Johnson Space Center mm -hmm. in uh, Texas, the Marshall Space Flight Center in uh, Alabama, mm -hmm. and the Kennedy Center in Florida. That's where the focus of the human spaceflight program is. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> Do we have other questions? Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, hello, thank you for the information. Um, so there is a radiation in space, and did it damage uh, any way Voyager like, during such a long, long period? Like it, its electronic systems, like space radiation, did it damage uh, yes. electronic systems of Voyager? That's right. It turns out we have Jupiter to thank partly for the long life of the Voyager spacecraft. But <laughs> Ju Jupiter's magnetic field traps uh, very intense radiation, uh, and that's deadly to electronics. And since we knew we had to fly by Jupiter to continue on to Saturn, we had to uh, design the spacecraft to survive this radiation environment of Jupiter. That's a form of rapid aging. So having survived the rapid aging of Jupiter, the slow aging, natural aging from the radiation that fills the space uh, out there uh, is a fairly small factor. So we have Jupiter to thank, forcing us to make a very robust radiation tolerant spacecraft. And, and you've actually, um, in, in, in previous talks about this, you've talked about 2020 or so being uh, a place where, you know, more of that radiation will have decayed and you'll have to shut down some systems. Give us sort of a, a timeline in your mind of when that's going to start really shutting yeah, down. Yeah, the power is this <clears throat> plutonium-238 with an 88-year half-life, so every year we have four watts less. Our prediction is we'll start having to start turning instruments off about uh, 20. 25, okay. less than 10 years from now, and by 2030, probably, we'll have to shut the spacecraft off. We will just not have enough power to run the basic uh, spacecraft and transmit the data back to Earth. The main fact power use on the spacecraft is the radio transmitter. Mm -hmm. um, you, you talked about the Voyager also uh, in its orbits around each of these planets. Uh, it, I'm, I'm assuming it's getting faster with each orbit. So uh, give us a, a rough uh, idea of the speed of this thing at this point. Voyager 1 is uh, moving outward at 17 kilometers per second. So Incredibly fast. Pretty fast. fast. Yeah. Uh, when we launched, we could not have gotten even to Saturn. We needed Jupiter to whip us on to Saturn. Mm -hmm. And so we got a lot of help from Sat Jupiter and Saturn on our way out. So the, the calculations that were done for this trip have, have still maintained their integrity up to this point. That's, yes, that's, that's right. That's a, a mind-boggling yes. exercise. Yeah. And um, the first one only saw two of the planets yeah. and then shot off towards interstellar space. Do I have that right? That's correct. Voyager mm -hmm. 1 flew by Saturn in such a way that because the ring plane was inclined like this, so Voyager 1, which had to fly behind the rings, ended up going up out of the plane of the planets. No more planetary encounters, but that allowed us to keep Voyager 2 in the plane. It didn't have to do the rings, because we'd already done that with Voyager 1. It didn't have to do Titan, which we did with Voyager 1. Stayed in the plane so it could go on to Uranus and then Neptune. At Neptune, Voyager, 1 went over, Voyager 2 went over the north pole of Neptune to get down to its moon, Triton, and so it's heading southward. So one's heading north and the other's heading south. So, so each of the times that Voyager started to encounter a planet, was that a, uh, uh, a month of great stress for you? Would you guys be sitting thinking, oh, no, it's going to run into the planet, it's going to, you know, something? Well, the stress was getting ready, not, okay. not so much worrying about it. It was uh -huh. actually being ready because the flyby happens whether you're ready or not. That <laughs> spacecraft is moving. If you make a mistake, that's too bad. Yeah. It's on its way. Yeah. So that's the, that's the real challenge is making sure the commands and uh, uh, timelines we sent up to these small computers were correct and would clock out because once it started running on auto, auto mode, it would just run until it finished whatever we told it to do, right or wrong. Right. It would follow instructions. Uh, how long of uh, a time does it take, for example, for Voyager to have uh, orbited? I, I realize the planets are of different sizes, but let's say Jupiter, for argument's sake. These were flybys, not orbiting. Fly okay, so not even... It's just a slingshot effect. Just gra it just grabs it and tosses it on, gravitationally. Very interesting. Do we have other questions? Yeah. We have one more online question. Okay. Um, Patty would like to know, what discovery, what scientific discovery have you been involved in during your tenure um, that has personally amazed you the most? Well, Voyager is a mission which really just kept amazing us. I mean, every encounter were things we just, we just surprised. So I like to have bookends. The first really big surprise that, that the moon of Jupiter called Io has 10 times the volcanic activity of Earth. Before that, the only known active volcanoes were on Earth. And here was a small moon with 10 times as much. That was a big surprise. 
and uh, the uh, and before Voyager, the only known ocean in the solar system was here on Earth. And then we found Europa, which it turns out has an ocean. Uh, it turns out Enceladus has an ocean. Uh, it's not unique. The Earth is not unique, after all. And the last bookend, the first bookend was Isle. The last bookend was Triton, which is a moon of Neptune, uh, which is about the same size as Pluto. Uh, it's about 40 degrees above absolute zero, well, minus uh, 234, whatever it is, degrees centigrade. Uh, and even so, even though this is near, free, near absolute zero, there were geysers erupting from its polar cap. Nobody really would have expected that. And now, now that the New Horizons flew by Pluto, guess what? Here's a moon, here's a whole minor planet now where it looks like it's dynamically active, even though it's also out there where the temperature is around 40 degrees above absolute zero. So these are the kinds of changes that have given us a whole different idea of what's going on in the solar system. These are not dead old bodies. Many of them are still thermally active like the Earth is. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for speaking with us today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Let's please give a round of applause for Dr. Stone, everybody. Okay.